Okay, so I'm very honored and glad to be here tonight to speak to the future of Czech medicine, probably also future of European medicine. We're going to talk about the lumbar spine. That's the first part of my presentations about spinal surgery and imaging that we need to see what we have to operate on when conservative treatment fails or when a patient's status is deteriorating very quickly. So the lumbar spine with the five vertebrae, the discs, sometimes if you see something in red there, this little piece of caoutchouc mimics a disc herniation. We'll see pictures in a few seconds. You're all young, healthy, and you don't have disc degener degeneration. That's very good. But about 80% of the people once in the lifetime go to the doctor because of back pain or cervical pain due to disc degeneration. Only 10% may need surgery for disc herniation, spinal stenosis, or segmental instability. So uh, this is a very old slide, but Mr. Kekadi Willis just uh, discovered that when disc degeneration starts, you have a dysfunction, you have the disc that uh, uh, gets uh, tears, and uh, you can have irritations, and so pain. Then, when the disc continues to de degenerate, when you have loss of disc material, you will have instability or decreased stability. We must be very cautious uh, with the word of instability of the spine in degenerative cases uh, because it's discussed very controversially. Only when you have uh, pain, neurological signs that are provoked by increased motion, then it's going to be maybe something that is interesting for the surgeon. This phase can go for a long time, and people have recurrent pains. Some don't need any operations, but after 20, 30 years, they get old and they get stiff because there are calcification and the spine restabilizes itself. These are the three phases. You probably know uh, the anatomy of the disc proteoglycans and water inside the nucleus pulposus. This is the shock absorber, the annulus fibrosus, and this is a connection between the vertebral bodies. Slow nutrition changes during the day and night. That means when you're upright the whole day, in the evening you're a few millimeters smaller. When you have a good long night's sleep, you're growing a few millimeters, the disc is rehydrated, and a uh, uh, nutrient flow in, but by a passive way. With aging disc dehydration, with loss of disc height, with tears, annular tears, where sometimes chemical products from the degenerative disc can go out and irritate the nerve, decreased load sharing and stability, balance problem, and maybe old people with many disc degeneration have a kyphoscoliosis, the vertebral column is no longer well aligned. You know that we have the, the seven cervical vertebrae, the 12 thoracic vertebrae, five lumbar vertebrae, the sacrum, five uh, sacral vertebrae fused. We have the intervertebral discs in between. Important, we have lordosis cervical and lumbar and kyphosis on the thoracic spine. And you see this is a little bit spring-like. And our vertebral column should be a functioning, shock-absorbing, spring-like motion, heavy loads may be carried. And uh, the maximal loads go when you're young and healthy through the anterior column. Anterior column, it means vertebral body, this vertebral body, this vertebral body, and so on. When the disc degenerates and become weak, the loads are transmitted posteriorly, so you have more loads on the two posterior columns, which are the two articular columns, the articular joints on the left and the right side. Our spine contains neural elements, very important, that the spinal cord that ends about at L1, L2, this is central nervous system. 
Then you have the peripheral nerves, the coda, equina, with these uh, roots that go out and then um, in the pelvis from the sciatic nerve, anteriorly the femoral nerve. And this is the, the lumbar canal with CSF and peripheral nerves. And that's why you can make for diagnostic purposes a lumbar puncture. L3-4, L4-5, you can do a lumbar puncture. May be problematic if the spinal canal is narrow, but never higher because you would risk to touch central nervous system, which uh, would have bad consequences. The thoracic and especially the cervical spine contain not only here the nerves of the cord equina, peripheral nerves, here goes the peripheral nerve roots, C6, C7, it will be C7 root, but it contains the spinal cord. This is central nervous system. Very important, if you have a injury to the cervical spine or if you have a disc herniation that slips and compresses here in the cervical spine, you may have not only a radiculopathy, not only problem with the nerves, but also problem with the spinal cord, a myelopathy. And here it's a uh, peripheral nerves, but it's, uh, it may be dangerous as well as we're gonna see in a few minutes. When we want to image when so and see what is wrong with the spinal column, with discs, with the, the size of the canal, of course, classically, we can do some radiographs. We, it's, it's an AP and lateral view. Anterior and lateral view, it's not transverse and it's not showing um, soft tissues. Invented by Röntgen, who got the Nobel Prize in 1901. Then we have the CT scan, axial imaging, axial viewing, assessing the tissue density. Hansfield invented that, and uh, units from Hansfield quantify the tissue density, high density for bone and low density for water. MRI is optimal for soft tissue for neural structure, and we have an upright MRI, which is rarely available in some specialized centers. I show you briefly then the EOS system, where the people can stand like that, and they undergo a total body scan, where you can see the whole skeleton, where you can see how the patient is positioned in the space, if he's in balance or if he's torted or different problems. Then today, almost nobody performs myelography. Myelography is lumbar puncture, injection of contrast medium, the liquid CSF is then visible by the Rex rays and then you can see where is the compression. But if somebody cannot go uh, undergo MRI or has ferromagnetic implants, then uh, myelogram and post myelo CT scan can be still useful. Discography is another option, but here you're stitching into the disc, you inject contrast medium into the disc, and you risk to do harm to the disc. That's why it's not the, the diagnostic method for everyone. So computer tomography, have you seen such a computer tomography somewhere already? Or undergone some. The first one was the Amy scanner in London, the second in Stockholm, and it came to Basel in 75, and I made a, a doctor thesis about a special case with pons bleeding where CT scan was excellent for diagnostic and also for follow-up, also because of hydrocephalus problems. MRI, no x-rays. One of the co-inventors was uh, Dr. Raymond Demedian. He invented the upright MRI. I'll show you a few uh, examples later. Quite low field. Normally MRI are 1.4 to uh, 3 Tesla. Experimental in university clinics, in neuroradiologists, you may have a 7 Tesla MRI. That would be the upright MRI. We have one in Zurich and in USA some. University of California, Los Angeles published a lot about the advantages of scanning people in the position where they experience pain. Some people may have no symptoms when they're lying down, but when they're upright, 
or bending backwards, then the pain comes. And so the correlation is better with upright MRI, and it's excellent for claustrophobic patients. EOS, about 15 years that the French are working with it to assess balance. You're in balance if when you're standing, you're using minimal muscle contraction to be in equilibrium. And remember, let's say for the cervical spine, your head is about six, seven kilos. If you're the whole day like that, you will get stretch strains and you will have maybe neck pain in the evening when you have been spending the whole day on the computer or the tablet. So this is quite useful, but again, for specialized centers, this would be to be discussed in a later lecture. X-rays, what can you get information? Structural you overview, transitional anomalies. You see the curves, low doses in cervical and lumbar spine. You see the alignment of the vertebrae, if you have a slip, a displacement or not and you see the angles best with EOS. Leg asymmetry. This is sometimes patient can have some back pain problem because they have a leg asymmetry. In this difficult x-ray, I show you a lot of things. First, the spine is not straight. You have a slight left convex uh, scoliosis on this side, a right curve on the other side, you see that this vertebra is slipping a little bit, a lateral listesis, L3 on L4, and you see that you have disc collapse. So X-ray, you can see a disc space, a disc space, a disc space, and you can see that here the disc space has disappeared. This vertebra is spontaneously fused. It's an old patient, and he has got osteophytes, and these are the measures uh, the, the, the how the nature can restabilize a spine by ossifying. Okay, and what you can see also, you have a very thin layer of cartilage here. You have a hip arthrosis with uh, sclerosis and very thin layer, almost disappearing layer. So you get a lot of information also that this leg is a little shorter asymmetry, pelvis is tilted. And here also you can see the aorta. There is arteriosclerosis also in the aorta. So plain x-ray still may be useful. And then dynamic x-ray, you want to see motion. Let's say in this case it was important to see is this unstable. Degenerated disc with stenosis, it's not unstable, you see it's aligned. This doesn't move, it's fused. This is anteriorly fused as well. You see that it's fixed almost. And, and here you have a motion, a little bit a physiologic motion in the upper lumbar and lower thoracic spine. X-rays may be useful also to see anomalies. Normally you have five lumbar vertebrae. Sometimes you have six and then you have to count 12 rib have you got L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, and a lumbalized S1, that means with processus transversus on both sides? Or is it a, a case where you have a sacralization of L5? You have L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5 is fused to the sacrum. And sometimes you have a hemi-anomaly that the transverse process is almost fixed to the sacrum, and sometimes you have a new neo joint here. This neo joint can be painful and do back pain. So little things that makes you think, but you must listen to the patient's history and make a clinical examination. And then knowing what you want to look for, ask for radiological examinations. CT and MRI. With CT and MRI, you have a transverse a axial view of the disc, of the spinal canal, of the joint spinous process. Young and healthy discs are hydrated. So in MRI, T2 sequence, you see CSF, water, and fatty tissue is white. White center of the disc, young and healthy. With time, it loses it becomes gray in MRI, 
darker, and then the disk height diminishes. And it goes then with a bulging. This is a bulging. This is not yet a disk herniation. It's like on your car when the tires are not well pumped up. You're pressing, and it, it makes a, a kind of a protrusion. It's not yet a herniation. You may also have an asymmetric bulge because degeneration can be asymmetrical. Next one is that the disc, the annulus fibrosus, gets tears, little ruptures here. And uh, through this way, there might be products from degeneration that leaks and irritates a nerve root. This is just a nice picture to show annular tear, here circumferential, here radial, and also to explain what we can see with discography, when they wanted to identify painful discs, you inject contrast medium into a disc. If you see this picture, this disc is continent, and this picture here, where the contrast medium flows out. And when you make a CT scan, you see here contrast medium from the center of the disc injected, that flows out, and that can irritate here. This is a pathologic discography. <coughs> Nowadays with MRI, we're satisfied with MRI. So the disc again, annular tear makes lumbago, that means back pain. And then the herniation, this is an old picture showing here that uh, uh, part of nucleus pulposus come out and compress a nerve. And then depending where is the disc herniation, you will have pain, sciatic pain when L5 and L1 roots are compressed, and femoral pain. <coughs> anterior tie pain when the L2, L3, L4 nerve roots are compressed. So the neural structure are, are important and in order to see how serious the business is, you, you want to assess is something coming out from the disc and compressing a nerve. So here you have a protrusion, you have still annulus. Here it's torn and material comes out. This is a true disc herniation. And this is a sequestration. That means that the piece of cartilage that goes out into the spinal canal can migrate. It can go up, down to the midline or very lateral through the canal outside. We extrusion, we will say it's a disc herniation in the clinical language. And we see free fragment migrated, important to get them out when we have to operate on such a case. Degeneration can, of course, go slowly silent, and at the end, you may have calcification and a stiff segment. Where is the free fragment or the disc herniation? Where does it compress a nerve? So, important from natural view, the vertebral body, the pedicles on the left and right side, the arch, that is the lamina, the lamina with the spinous process. Laterally, we have the transverse processes and going up on both sides and then also down on both sides, you have the upper articular and the lower articular process. Pedicle, that's the place where you can introduce a Yamshidi needle, make a puncture, make a biopsy, or inject cement when you have an osteoporotic compression fracture the technique percutaneously, minimally invasive, can go through the pedicle. But also when you have a fracture, dislocation of vertebrae of a trauma, and you have to reconstruct and fix a deformity after breaking uh, uh, some vertebrae, you will put screws in the pedicles and connect with rods and uh, plates. This is the midline. Then you have here subarticular zone. This one is the lateral recess. The lateral recess is here, is when the nerve curves, it's the medial part of the pedicle. The nerve goes here and goes out here. Here's the extra foraminal zone. Some disc herniation may occur here and uh, compress the nerve at this level. And you have the foraminal level, you have the, the joints above this, and they, this bridge of joints, make the Hole from the foramen, the articular process, the lower one from the upper vertebrae goes with the 
superior tegral process from the lower vertebrae, and this is deformant intervertebrale. So it's for description. Where I, I have I to search and look for a disc herniation? Herniation stenosis instability, three pathologies, three problems we have to meet, and uh, sometimes it's a combined problem, and if it's combined on several levels, you have to have uh, more and bigger and the more difficult surgery. This is an MRI scan. You see why the CSF, the cord stops here at L1, L2. Here there is a kyphotic segment L4, L5. You have here a disc extrusion that points a little bit downward. So this is a little bit destabilized segment plus a neural compression that uh, may be treated surgically when conservative treatment doesn't help and the patient continues to suffer daily and deteriorating, then if he deteriorates, you have to act a little bit quicker and be in favor of surgery because it helps mechanical solution for a mechanical problem in the spinal canal. To compare CT scan, this is bone, optimal for bone anatomy. The spinal canal normally has this uh, delta form and here you see this half would be normal, but this one not. You have here a calcified compression. This is from the joint capsule and the ligamentum flavum, a calcified cyst, and here the uh, lateral recess, and here it is narrowed. So the patient can have here a root problem, L5, for instance, because of this compression. Here. MRI here, you don't see the nerves, you don't see the CSF. Here you see better CFF, the little points, the black are the nerves, and you see the joints, and here you have some fluid in the joints. So this is uh, some signs of irritation and some of decreased stability. This corner is the lateral recess, first the subarticular zone, then comes the pedicle and the lateral recess, and this is where we have to do a decompression to free patients who suffer from a disc herniation with excruciating pain. And so image is okay, but you must have clinical findings. And the uh, examination is very important. You can have first the vertebral syndrome. He has pain, he has a, a scoliotic deformity, and he has a decreased motion of the lumbar spine. And on pressure, he has got tenderness, when you press, it provokes pain. You can try to make a local anesthesia of a facet joint to decrease pain. But if the problem is mainly neural compression, it will not help a lot. And then the neural compression determines if it's going to be surgical or not. Little neural compression, you can do conservative treatment. But if you have deficits, motor deficits, paresis, and sensory deficits, then it's a, a, a case where you could uh, consider surgery. Radicular syndrome, you know that when you're moving your leg like that, your, your vertebral, your, your, your root moves like that. If you have here a disc herniation that compresses, then you have pain in your leg. You have a leg pain, a positive LASIK sign, straight leg raising test. So the people who can go up with the leg very high, it's okay. But if you take their leg, straight leg, you elevate and <coughs> stop and he blocks at 20 degrees, it's a sign that the nerve is very, very much irritated. For the upper nerve roots, L2, L3, L4, you must make the inverse last leg and you promote uh, femoralgia. We have one case, very rare, called equina compression with saddle anesthesia and incontinence is when a big herniation compresses all the nerve roots in the spinal canal. Have you already had the chance to, uh, to learn neurological segments and so on? L1, inguinal, iliopsoas, iliopsoas and quadriceps, L2, L3. L4 has also a little bit innervation of iliopsoas, but mainly the quadriceps, patella, pretibial, the, the, the decreased sensation. Then the L5, very frequent, foot drop, stepping. That means that the, 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 the patients, when they walk, are not able to walk on the heels. They will 
because they cannot extend their foot. And the sensation L5 goes to the big toe. And uh, the problem with S1, no more work as prima ballerina because you cannot stand on the tiptoes. This is probably more familiar to you to repeat that this is the iliopsoas, this is the quadriceps, this is also triceps sures S1. Uh, the example would be this problem, you see, this craniation and spinal canal migrating upward, and when it's quite large, it compresses the L4 and the L3 nerve root. You can have biradicular deficits caused by one disc herniation. Next footballer, uh, with uh, the one with the adductors, here he kicks, so it will be extension of the foot. Here also in plant of flexion, which is then S1. These are nice cases. I think you can recognize obstacles in the spinal canal. Here, the fluid CSF, here CFF, and here almost a stop. And here, almost no CSF visible here in the fecal sac. Big disc herniation. Also, this one with a long fragment migrated very far caudally. These are good cases for surgery. Imaging, however, doesn't give information how hard, how soft maybe this disc material is and if it's chemically aggressive or not. Patient may have individual uh, varied uh, reactions to this disturbed neural micro microcirculation, this induced disbalance or instability. And uh, the problem is we cannot image pain. We have to do a Sherlock Holmes work when we're looking at patients to identify and to establish a good correlation between what we find, the history of the patient, the clinical signs of the patients, the deficits, the neurological deficits, and then the imaging findings. That would be to repeat the discography and here MRI with an annular tear. Options, conservative first. This was a case with uh, some pain but not uh, much neurology and wanted to be uh, treated conservatively and it may work because our ma macrophage, our immune cell can eat up a little bit of disc material and this disc material can lose hydration, become soft. And so this was uh, in, in uh, April, this disc herniation. And then when we uh, checked in, in, uh, in September, the disc herniation had almost disappeared. Here the tear, here the disc uh, herniation, and then here little bulging, little residual one, but uh, this patient uh, escaped surgery and uh, nature managed to uh, treat the, the, the disease. So for surgical uh, indications, you must know and you must inform the patients in the individual concrete situation. He must cite an ins uh, as uh, informed consent for surgery as every surgery has a little risk, general risk at bleeding infections and maybe in the neurology or so deterioration if you touch the nerve, if you uh, injure the ner nerve during surgery, it's bad. Okay, emergency surgery, these are the best case, very rare. If you don't do that, you may be sued because you didn't help a patient who is suffering and deteriorating. Good indication, neurological deterioration with uh, motor deficits and excruciating pain. And we have planned surgery when conservative treatment fails. We don't operate image, but daily suffering patients. And the correlation is not optimal, but uh, it's important to correlate clinical findings and imaging findings. Despite of this, they are clear and good surgical indications. So I show you a little bit. You locate the disc herniation. It's to see, uh, it would be an extra foraminal one here. This one has a double root compression like I showed previously. This one migrates caudally. This one is the axilla. You must pay attention not to injure the nerve in this case uh, when you operate on uh, this one. and. Uh, big median extrusion 
may cause a coda equina syndrome. That's very bad because you're losing the sphincter functions. You have no sensation between the legs and the perineal area and you become incontinent, impotent, and depending where it is, you may have uh, S1 or uh, L5 deficits in addition. You see that's very large, very large disc herniation causing CODA syndrome, and uh, to operate on that is a good thing. Also such a large disc herniation here is good to be treated surgically, and I show you how it works. This is another variant to see that it's not always in the canal, but it can be in the foramen here and outside the foramen. This is the one which is also on the model, and these are two pieces of this we got out by a lateral approach. We didn't open the canal, we went laterally to take out this foraminal disc herniation. So imaging helps us to plan surgery, where do we want to operate on? Now, imitators of symptoms of disc herniations may be synovial or juxta articular cysts because flavium and synovial joint capsule, they are together. And uh, when you have a, a cyst, it's difficult to see exactly from where it comes from. We take this lesion out and the pathologist uh, describes some uh, degenerative changes in that tissue. This is a, a compression from posterior. So the patient, we want to make microdiscectomy. It's a small incision. In a very slim lady, maybe 2.5 centimeters, normally three and a half to four centimeters. You want to see something. And so to know where you are, you have to do a fluoroscopic localization. <coughs> you see here a needle, this dark point. I hope you can see that. You stick a needle here or you lay it like that, and then you, you make a, a mark uh, with a filzstift, as this pencil, yes. And then, of course, you disinfect and cover that up, and you know where it is. So this is lateral view. If you have a, a transitional anomaly, you may use lateral view, and you make this uh, view. What you're going to do, you incise the skin, you incise the fascia, and then you detach the muscles from the fascia and uh, you go down, 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 and you see the ligamentum flavum. You detach the muscle from the lower lamina, from the upper lamina, you must see bone. So this is the patient when everything is covered and when you have opened, you put in the retractor that, uh, and proceed to microdiscectomy under microscope. And it looks then like that, wait a second. This is the schematic drawing. You have made the incision. You have uh, put aside the muscles. You introduce the retractor to see here, lamina, ligamentum flavum lamina. And uh, when you, that is the schematic view, lamina L4, lamina L5, bone, bone, in between ligamentum flavum, laterally will be the joint. And then this is what you need as exposure and you have to remove the flavum to see and here I show you intraoperatively, this is the nerve, and this white material is cartilage, the disc herniation. You have to go with the retractor to take the nerve, retract the nerve. Here the nerve is retracted, and here comes out the disc herniation. Schematic view, it looks like that, that you remove the flavum, you see the dura, you see the nerve, and you have to go here lateral to the nerve normally to find the disc herniation and remove the disc herniation. When you have a double compression, L5 and L4, in the canal and outside the canal, outside the foramen, you may do a double decompression and you keep bony bridge to stop destabilization, to prevent destabilization. And here, normally, you make such a little window, taking a little bit of bone away, the ligamentum flavum, to go down and remove that piece of cartilage that compresses the nerve root. To show you MRI, there are sequences T1 and T2. T2 is the myelographic one because white is water and fat. White is here the CSF, and you see here that you don't have, you have an obstruction. It's stenotic. And here the CSF is gray, so I prefer this one. But nevertheless, you can see here osteophytes, 
this is a collapsed vertebral uh, body, uh, collapsed disc, and here it's spontaneously fused. You see also here nature is building bone, but this bone delimination is not so clear in uh, the um, uh, MRI than with CT scan. <coughs> Second subject is stenosis. Stenosis, when we started measuring with CT scan, we said uh, AP diameter should be above 13 millimeters. Then uh, relative stenosis 10 to 12 millimeters and absolute stenosis is less than 10 millimeters diameter. Normally you have a delta shape of the spinal canal, but degeneration, hypertrophy of the facet joints can make that it becomes narrow. Here you have a narrowing of the lateral recess entrance. This is again the image where lateral recess is narrow because you have a calcified cyst. And <coughs> you can have lateral stenosis at the foraminal level. Here you have a normal reconstruction of an uh, intervertebral foramen in CT scan. And here you see bone, hypertrophic bone narrowing the foramen. So sites of bony entrapment, where is the nerve in trouble? When you have this degeneration, you have dehydration and discate loss. Discate loss here can make that the root that has to curve around the pedicle may be kinked. Then this case loss makes that the facet joint will come up and compress the nerve at the foraminal exit. And then hypertrophy of the facet, that means intervertebral joint degeneration, spondylarthrosis, make that the nerve root subarticularly is compressed. So these are the three sites of bony entrapment according to McNabb. To repeat, normal size here, triangle delta. Here, a disc herniation in a normal wide canal, and you have CSF visible. In CT scan, you don't see CSF, but you see the bony shape very well. You can have a congenital narrow canal, and then you have this so-called trefoil shape of your spinal canal, with age and with degeneration, you see that uh, spondylophrosis and thickening of ligamental flavor can produce that trefoil uh, shape of the narrow spinal canal. MRI is best. MRI is best because if you want to know is it narrow or not, look, do you see cerebral spinal fluid? CSF is white. Here, 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 is white. This is not a stenosis for us surgeons, irrelevant. Then, okay, here it's gray. You don't see much CSF, it becomes to become narrow. It starts to develop the stenosis. And the cases for surgery are rather C and D. D, everything is gray to black. And the C, you have the fat, the epidural fat here that compresses from dorsal. So the important thing in stenosis anatomy do you see CSF, yes or no? And if CSF disappeared, then you may be concerned that the patient has neurological deficits. This is a D-type stenosis. You see gray to, to, to black, thickened ligamenta flava, larger facet joints, of course, and the disc bulging. On the contrary, on the other level, there is a small disc herniation, but the canal is not uh, large. You have white. You see CSF, this spinal canal at this level is not narrow, but it's here a maximal stenosis. Do you know something about the signs and symptoms of lumbar stenosis? It's a chronic narrowing. It takes long time. Many patients uh, do uh, sufficiently well, and they say, well, I'm getting old. I'm not going for a long walk. I'm not going to uh, spend hours walking. Uh, it's uh, slowly progressing, and sometimes deterioration is due to disc herniation or instability. It can be uh, provoked by a, a trauma, a fall, and uh, motor deficit may, of course, occur in due time, and they may appear maybe only during exercise. So Hatchoff Lasseg, Lasseg is the straight leg uh, raising test. If the nerve is narrowed but not uh, very much compressed. Uh, the patient can uh, have the, 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 the leg quite uh, elevated without having the pain down to the feet. But then you make him 
move the feet. And vascular surgery in geology, the Ratschow lift up the legs and have the people moving and they have then pain and they want to stop this exercise. You go down and you say, extend your foot and if it's uh, N5 nerve root narrowing, he will have a foot weakness for a few uh, seconds, maybe only that the latent paresis become evident during that test. Now you have to make a differential diagnosis between the vascular claudication and between the neurogenic claudication. Vascular problems may occur also with age, arteriosclerosis, aortic, uh, iliac femoral artery stenosis, ischemic syndrome. And the patients have the 5P, the blue one, Pain paresthesia paresis is in neurogenic claudication and in vascular claudication in arterial stenosis, but you have a paler and pulseless foot in vascular stenosis. 5P and 3P is maybe something you, you can uh, keep in mind for your examination in angiology or vascular surgery. So your claudication patient has no paler of the feet or no pulseless foot. Exception is that he has two pathologies, that he has arterial narrowing plus spinal canal narrowing. Okay, nice example here. You see a beginning little cyst here. This is a left predominant spinal cyanosis, and we're gonna do some surgery on it. In order to minimize the trauma, you can operate from one side. You cut here, you detach the muscle on one side, not on both sides. And you make here the opening, the bony opening, you remove bone, then you tilt the table and you remove ligament and flavum and bone on the other side. That means you decompress uh, stenosis bilaterally by unilateral approach. You make unilateral trauma to muscles only. This is one, you see the stenosis, D-type, here, a little predominant on the left, we go from the left, we cut away, drill away this bone, remove ligamentum flavor, and this is the post-operative MRI scan. We wanted to see that we did well at surgery. It was more a CT, uh, MRI for curiosity, but you see the patient has pain. He is unable to walk uh, more than 10 or 50 meters without stopping, and here he's uh, going again to walk more and more. It may be monoradicular. You may have a monoradicular claudication that only one nerve is dysfunctional because it's only one side, one nerve compressed. So foraminal stenosis is uh, another uh, problem you have to address. You see here white, here goes the nerve out, and here it's compressed. You see here a little bit white fat at the upper level, here minimal, but here no fat around the exiting nerve root, exiting nerve root, exiting nerve root. You have such a situation when you want to operate on that, you do an external approach and drill off the tip of the facet joint that compresses the nerve that comes out through the foramen. There are some technical details, but radiology sh should show you where is the problem and where ha have I got to correct that. So. Uh, then you have another problem. You have uh, patients who have position and motion dependent problems. This is the uh, problem that you're gonna look for. Is it unstable or is it stable? And when you have a uh, instability in addition, you may have to make a larger surgery and stabilize the motion segment. So basically here, we had lateral radiographs. Then we had historically the myelogram where you have the contrast medium injected. The patient makes uh, anteflexion and retroflexion and you see if you have a compression or a total stop. Easiest one would be the upright MRI where you uh, examine a patient in the painful position and uh, then you assess uh, what is happening when he experienced pain. Now, we have of course some Definitions, what is unstable is increased motion that causes pain and or neurologic deficits, neurologic signs, also pseudoradicular signs. This was in Zurich. I was part of it with Jean-Pierre Elzik uh, 
uh, and we published a few papers with a dynamic MRI. So on the lumbar spine, if you have a slip of more than 4.5 millimeter and an angulation, a segmental angulation of more than 22 millimeters, it is not very stable, it's radiologically unstable. This is a picture of dynamic MRI. When the patient bends forward, the foramen goes up. When he bends backwards, foramen closes, but you still see the nerve root and fat, white fat around the nerve root. It's not compressed, it's a normal patient. Here we have another patient. When you make a recumbent MRI, you may see that. Okay, you see CSF here. More, you see also this facet joint effusions. You have liquid in the facet joints. You have the impression, okay, it's arthrosis, it's degenerated, but it doesn't solve the problem. The patient has paresthesias and increasing foot weakness when he's walking. After 200 meters of walking, he needs to break. He bends forward or sits down. So it looks that uh, it's a, a position-dependent claudication. And when you do this upright MRI in extension, you see that you have the fluid making a cyst protrude. Here, the flavum coming up, and you see that the size of the spinal canal drastically diminished. This is a dynamic stenosis. So, imaging by dynamic myelogram and postmyelograph CT scan can be done when a patient has got ferromagnetic implants after a failed spondylodesis, or if he's wearing a pacemaker and you don't have a clue. Three aspects of instability. You examine the patient, he has pain in bending forward, and especially this uh, sign. He bends forward, pain, and then he has to push like that to get <coughs> up again. Okay. This microphone was a little bit unstable. <laughs> and uh, the apprehension, the patient says, no, I don't want to make this exercise. I know I will be in pain afterwards. Then you have radiologic instability. Uh, you can examine this with uh, dynamic x-rays or upright MRI. The dynamic uh, radiologic instability is this uh, 4.5 millimeters anti-retrolysthesis or angulation. And intratopoperative instability, you can test it during the operation. Just remember the three column spine of Louis, it's useful to know anterior column is vertebral body disc, vertebral body disc. And the two posterior columns are the articular joints on the left and right side. A disc herniation, a big one, massive disc degeneration weakens the anterior column. Loads are transferred more posteriorly. You will get a spondylophrosis. And so this uh, led to the surgery where you want to introduce something when you remove the disc. You want to fill the disc space with cages and bone to stabilize the disc, to make a disc space uh, increase after, of course, decompressing the nerve roots. So radiologic instability, again, this is the 4.5 millimeters translation. Well, half centimeter is easier to uh, keep in mind, especially if you have a tall person. It may be different if you have a person two meters high or only one meter fifty high. So clinical context is important. Angulation, if it's too much angulation when he bends forward and backward. And then you have the indicators of reduced stability. So retrolysthesis, antrolysthesis, intradiscular, intradiscal and intraarticular gas or vacuum phenomenon. These are indicators that the segment is less stable. End plate marrow edema can be described and also missy, missing bony elements after surgery. So your imaging have to assess in the operated patient does something miss, is something dis has been destabilized by an operation. It may be the case. So then you want to analyze motion, and it's in the, in the 3D. Uh, you have a X, Y, Z axis. It's a translation, a possibility, or a rotation, and often a coupled motion. So here, just to show you, the X axis goes uh, laterally. So this would be increased motion, more than 22 degrees angulation around the X axis. Rotation, 
Here, an example where a facet joint has been resected and you have a subluxation of the facet joint. And then the ver vertical y-axis is that you have a disk space uh, decrease, a loss of disk material, and this is becoming unstable. Example, antrolysthesis here along the z-axis, lateralysthesis along the x-axis, and you can measure all that, but then it must fit with the patient's clinical condition. You don't operate a picture, you operate on a patient who is deteriorating where conservative treatment doesn't help. The old myelogram, again to show you, you make a lumbar puncture and you fill the canal with uh, contrast medium. Here you have some instability, but no compression. Here you have a stop. The, the contrast medium injected doesn't flow. It's a total stop. You're over uh, exceeding half centimeters of motion. This would be uh, instability with a stenosis, which causes trouble. And that's what it looks like on dynamic MRI. You see bending forward, you have CSF on the canal. But bending backward, you have a stop of the CSF. And then when you look at the axial imaging, you see the subarticular entrapment, the flavum bulging, and the lateral recess very narrow. This is bad for the patient. When the patient is opened, you can put clamps on the spinous process and pull on the spinous process and see if it's very easy and it's very, uh, easy to make the patient move a lot, this segment move a lot during the surgery. Okay, to repeat, you're looking at this x-ray. Here you see osteophyte collapsed disc, or maybe it's stable, but what did happen here? It was unstable because a facet was resected. Missing bony element, decreased rotatory instability, and this is a case where nature did correct. So remember that this is instability due to missing bony element. If in the spine you have missing bony element, the spine segment may be destabilized. Then anatomy again, the facet joint, articular joint in the vertebral uh, joints. If too much is resected, they won't act as rotatory break and you may, may have here a rotatory deformity. The facet joint is a nice picture in a postmyelographic CT scan, uh, S1, L5 facet, article of uh, uh, facet, and here you see that the, this acts as rotatory break. This one is fixed. It cannot rotate too much, and that's an at not anatomical structure that uh, uh, keeps stability. So decompressive surgery uh, is useful, is good, but too much may be destabilizing and making iatrogenic problems. And this is one that occurs after degeneration, you see, rotation, intradiscal gas vacuum phenomenon, is degeneration with nitrous oxide uh, uh, accumulation, rotatory instability, subluxa subluxation of this facet joint. So you see, Imaging tells a lot. Also here, instead of fluids in nucleus pulposus, nitrous oxide, degeneration. And also in the joint, fluid or gas is a sign of decreased stability. So to conclude, imaging should localize symptomatic lesions, must analyze the amount of degeneration we have a classification from Firman who classifies and quantifies the amount of disc dehydration and amount of disc hate loss. The black disc without water and totally collapsed is Firman 5, that's the worst one. Modic is an end plate reaction. You may have edema in the end plate adjacent to a disc that is de de degenerating. These patients are more prone to have back pain. And then this, uh, the facet degeneration, the joints, if they become here hypertrophic, the flavum, 
it may be a, a source of stenosis. Check bony stru structures, as we said, missing after surgery, decreased stability. Check alignment, look for deformity. And uh, do you see things that uh, you could say, oh, this is going to be less stable, we must dynamic imaging, dynamic imaging to see if there is excessive motion and if this motion correlates with clinical signs that are provoked by motion, then it might be a candidate for surgery. So motion analysis by dynamic studies and MRI, uh, often you can co uh, complete MRI with dynamic radiographs if you don't have the upright MRI technology. Uh, so the surgical indication will be given when the patient deteriorates despite of conservative treatment, when the patient develops more and more <coughs> neurologic signs. <coughs> So to conclude, he said, for you, enjoy being young and mobile before uh, this degeneration starts. And it's a genetical program that starts early or late, depending on genetics programmation. Conservative treatment is efficient in 80 to 19% of patients. Okay, then instability. Restabilization fusion is an option, not a must. You must have really a mechanical large problem that is not solved by conservative treatment and the patient, if he's deteriorating and willing to be operated, you can do good things for him when you operate on him. <coughs> Nature works for you. This will collapse, calcification will occur, osteophytes will form and you will be old and stiff, but maybe too stenotic needing a decompression. So that's the, 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 the whole problem. Uh, we neurosurgeons or spine surgeon, orthopedic surgeon with special uh, um, training for spine uh, are facing every day uh, in our clinical practice. And we must uh, be able to proceed to adequate surgical planning. You will hear minimally invasive, okay, but it must be not insufficiently decompressive. You must not make a big decompression, destabilize the spine that will need another operation. So that is the art of surgery. For you far out future, it's important to take the history, to examine clinically the patient, to see and understand radiological findings, correlation with anatomy. And this is a nice case with combined pathology, fortunately at one level. Stenosis, discarniation, instability, L4, L5. So what did we do? We decompressed from both sides, we removed disc from both sides and introduced from both sides a cage where we can uh, introduce and screw in the middle uh, a plate that goes and makes a lordotic cage. And we uh, did uh, a monography, I brought a, a, a paper uh, for the faculty and the second one was this book together with Randy Jenkins, who was the pioneer of upright MRI. This picture is just to show what we want to avoid. Good uh, clinic study and radiologic study and establishing a correlation and discussing under colleagues to have the optimal surgical treatment when it's needed, not to have such a kind of failed back surgery syndrome the upright MRI is restricted area, too little uh, uh, engines. This EOS system useful for saying, uh, is the patient in equilibrium or not? We don't want to have such a problem with the spines or maybe an implant that dislocates. And the respect of physiological curves when you operate on cervical lumbar spine and you fix it, avoid making a straight fusion. No lordosis here makes that the upper segment want to compensate and will go into retrolist disease. They will be stressed and you will have then the adjacent segment disease. This is a patient with a two level fusion here in myelogram. And you see here you have a problem. This is a stenosis, the CT scan after the myelogram, almost no contrast medium within the canal. The stop is here at L3, L4. It is an adjacent segment disease after a two level fixation. That's a problem that can occur. So it's not always easy and I'm still learning. This thing called spine, I just can't handle it. 
on the melody of Queen's crazy little thing called Love, it's crazy little thing called Spy, this disc that slipped, shall I remove or replace it? Uh, replace it, I ain't ready for that crazy little thing called Spy. And I think we are learning continuously and technology make surgery easier. You will all have planning surgery with maybe robotic help. You won't miss a pedicle screw because you have a robotic arm coupled to imaging that will make the optimal screw insertion so no iatrogenic lesion when you will maybe later some of you operate on the spine. I wish you a lot of success and this was very nice uh, to be at uh, Professor Calva's courses and uh, to play here at the course and uh, here at the Doctors' Bowl in uh, April. So I hope to see you again. All the best. Thank you for your attention.